Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's the Cube, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and the Information Quality Symposium. Now, here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and George Gilbert. Hi, you're watching the Cube, SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program. We go out to lots of technology shows and symposiums like uh, this one here, help extract the signal from the noise. Uh, I'm Stu Miniman, joined, joined by George Gilbert uh, from the Wikibon research team, and really thrilled to have on the program uh, the keynote speaker uh, from this MIT event, Tom Davenport, uh, who's professor at Babson, uh, author of uh, some books, including a new one that just came out, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, great to be here. All right, so uh, you, you know, so many things in your morning keynote that I know George and I want to dig into. I, I, I guess I'll start with, uh, you, you talk about the you know, four eras of, uh, you called it data today. It used to be four, Information. Yeah, call, information, yeah, sorry. Yeah, but you yeah, said yeah. you started with, uh, when it was three eras of analytics, and now you've changed the information. So I'm just curious, we, you know, we get caught up sometimes on semantics, but is there a reason why you switch from uh, you know, uh, analytics to information now? Well, I'm, I'm not sure it's a permanent switch. I just um, did it for this occasion. But you know, I, I think that it's important for even people who aren't, who don't have as their job um, doing something with analytics to realize that um, analytics are how we turn data into information. So kind of on a whim, I changed it from four areas of analytics to four areas of, of information to, to kind of broaden it out in a sense and make people realize that the whole world is changing. It's not just about analytics. Yeah, no, I, I, it, it resonated with me because oh, you know in the tech industry so much we get caught up on the latest tool. I, George will be talking about how Hadoop is moving to Spark and you know right if we step back and look from a longitudinal view, um, you know data is something that's been around for a long time. But as as you said from Peter Drucker's quote, when we endow that with relevance and purpose, you know that that's when we get information. So. Uh, yeah, changes, and yeah. that's why I got interested in analytics you know, 20 years or, ago or so. It was um, uh, because we weren't thinking enough about how we endowed data with relevance and purpose. Um, turning it into knowledge and knowledge management was one of those ways, and I did that for a long time, but uh, the people who were doing stuff with analytics weren't really thinking about any of the human mechanisms for adding value to, to data. So that move me in an analytics direction. Okay, so, so Tom, you've been at this event before, you know, you, you've taught and written and, you know, written books about this, uh, about this whole space, so. Are you what, saying what, I'm old? No, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> you, 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 you've got a great perspective. Uh, uh, okay, so bring us, what, what's exciting you these days? What, what are some of our big challenges and big opportunities uh, that we're facing as uh, kind, of, kind of humanity and, and an industry? Yeah, well I think, for me, the most exciting thing is there are all these areas where there's just too much data and too much analysis for humans to to do it anymore. You know, when I first started working with um, analytics, the idea was some human analyst would have a hypothesis about how to do the, the uh, about what's going on in the data, and you'd uh, um, gather some data and test that hypothesis and so on. It could take weeks, if not months. And now, you know, we need, need to make decisions in milliseconds on way too much data for a human to absorb. Even in areas like healthcare, we have 400 different types of cancer, hundreds of genes that might be related to cancer, hundreds of drugs to administer. You know, we have these decisions have to be made by technology now, and so very interesting to think about what's the remaining human role. How do we make sure those decisions are good? How do we review them and understand them? All sorts of fascinating new issues, I think. Along those lines, Tom, you know, in a, at a primitive level um, in the big data realm, w the tools are kind of um, still emerging and we want to keep track of every time someone's touched it or transformed it. But when you talk about something as serious as cancer, and let's say we, we're modeling how we decide to, or how we get to a diagnosis, do we need a similar mechanism so that it's not either or, either the doctor or you know some sort of uh, machine machine learning model or, or cognitive model, some way to for the model to say here's how I arrived at that conclusion, and then for the doctor to say you know to the patient here's my thinking along those lines. Yeah, I mean um, I think 
one can like or dislike Watson, uh, which is being used for a lot of these, IBM Watson is being used for a lot of these oncology-oriented projects. And the good thing about Watson in that context is it does kind of presume a, a human asking a question in the first place and then a human deciding whether to take the answer. The answers in most cases still have confidence intervals, you know, confidence levels associated with them. So, um, uh, and in healthcare, it's great that we have this electronic medical record where the physician's decision or the clinician's decision about how to treat that patient is recorded. In a lot of other areas of business, we don't really have that kind of system of record to say, you know, what, what decision did we make and why did we make it and so on. So in a way, I think healthcare, despite being very backward in a lot of areas, is kind of better off than than a lot of areas of business. The other thing I often say about healthcare is if they're treating you badly and you die, at least there will be a meeting about it in a healthcare <laughs> institution. In business, you know, we screw up a decision, we push it under the rug, nobody ever, nobody ever considers it. <laughs> what about um, 30 years ago, I think it was, with uh, Porter's second book, you know, and, and the concept of the value chain and sort of remaking the, the understanding of strategy. Um, and you're talking about the, you know, the, the AP, API economy and, and the data flows within that. Can you help tie your concept, you know, the data flows, um, the data value chain and the APIs that connect them with the uh, Porter's value chain across companies? Well, that's an interesting idea. I think, you know, companies are just starting to realize that we are in this API economy. You don't have to do it all yourself. The smart ones have, without kind of modeling it in any systematic way, like the Porter Value Chain have said, um, you know, we, we need to have other people um, linking to our information through APIs. Um, Google is fairly smart, I think, in saying, uh, we'll even allow that for free for a while, and if it looks like there's money to be made, then we'll start charging for access to those APIs. So, you know, building the access and then thinking about the, the revenue from it is um, one of the new principles of this approach. But I haven't seen, it's, it's, I think it would be a great idea for a paper to say, how do we tra uh, translate the sort of value chain ideas of Michael Porter, which were, I don't know, 30 years ago, into um, something for the API-oriented world that we live in today. Would you think? Um, would you think that might be appropriate for the sort of platform economics um, model of thinking that's emerging? That's an interesting question. I mean, the um, platform people are quite um, interested in. Uh, um, Inner organizational connections. I don't hear them as talking as much about, you know, the the new rules of the API economy. It's more about um, how do two-sided and, and multi-sided platforms work and so on. Um, uh, eh, Michael Porter was a sort of industrial economist. A lot of those platform people are economists. So, from that sense, it's the same kind of overall thinking. But um, lots of opportunity there to exploit, I think. All right, so Tom, I want to bring it back to kind of the chief data officer, uh, one of the main themes of the, of the symposium here. Uh, I really liked you talked about kind of, there needs to be a balance of offense and defense, because uh, so much, uh, at least in the last couple of years that we've been covering this, you know, governance seems to be kind of a central piece of it. And, and but it's you, such an exciting and, subject, governance, Yeah, it's, it's an exciting it? subject, yeah. but you, you know, you, you put that purely in defense, uh, and you know, we get excited, the, the companies that are, you know, building new products, you know, either, you know, saving or making more money with with data. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, as you see how this chief data officer needs to be, how that fits into your kind of four eras? Yeah, yeah, well, um, I don't know if I mentioned it in my talk, but I, I um, went back and confirmed my suspicion that um, Usama Fayyad was the world's first chief data officer uh, at Yahoo. Um, and I looked at what um, Usama did at Yahoo, and it was very much data product and offense oriented. He established Yahoo Research Labs. Um, you know, not everything worked out well at Yahoo in retrospect, but I think they were going in the direction of 
what interesting data products can, can we create? And so I think um, we saw a lot of kind of what I call 2.0 companies in the, in the big data area in Silicon Valley saying, it's not just about internal decisions from data, it's what can we provide to customers in terms of data, not just access, but things that really provide value. That means data plus analytics. So, you know, at LinkedIn, um, they attribute about half of their membership to the people you may know um, data product, and everybody else has a people you may know now as well. We, th these companies haven't been that systematic about how you build them and how do you know which ones to actually take to market and so on, but um, I think now more and more companies, even big industrial companies, are realizing that this is a distinct possibility and we ought to, we ought to look um, externally um, with our data for opportunities as much as supporting internal yeah, decisions. And, and I guess for you talk to you know, companies like Yahoo, some of the big web companies, uh, the, the, the whole you know, big data meme has been about allowing uh, you know, tools and processes to get to a broader uh, you know, piece of the economy. You know, counterbalance that a little bit, you, you know, large public clouds and services. You know, how much can you know, a, a broad spectrum of companies out there you know, get the skill set and really take advantage of these tools versus you know, or is it, is it going to be something that I'm gonna, still going to need to go to some outside source for some of this? Well, you know, I think it's all being democratized fairly rapidly. I, mean, I read yesterday the first time the quote, nobody ever got fired for choosing Amazon Web Services. <laughs> um, uh, that's a lot cheaper than the, the previous um, company in that role, which was IBM, uh, where you had to uh, build up all these internal capabilities. So um, I, um, I think the human side is being democratized. There are over 100, company, uh, over 100 universities now in the US alone that have um, analytics-oriented um, uh, degree programs. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for existing companies to do this, it's just a matter of awareness um, on the part of the, the management team. I think that's what's lacking in most cases. They're not watching your, your shows, I guess, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Along the lines of the, you know, going back 30 years, we had a preference, actually a, a precedent, um, where the PC software sort of just exploded onto the scene and it was, I want control over my information, not just spreadsheets, you know, creating my documents. But then at the, at the same time, IT did not have those guardrails to, you know, help, help people from falling off, you know, their bikes and getting injured. What are the, what tools and technologies do we have for both audiences today so that we don't repeat that mistake? Yeah, no, it's a very interesting question. And I think, you know, um, spreadsheets were great, you know, the ultimate democratization tool, but depending on which study you believe, 20 to 80% of them had errors in them. Uh, and there were some pretty bad decisions that were made sometimes with them. So we now have the tool so that we could tell people, uh, you know, that spreadsheet is not going to calculate the right value, or you should not be using a pie chart for that visual display. I think vendors need to start building in those guardrails, as you put it, to say, here's how you use this product effectively in addition to just accomplishing your, your basic task. But you wouldn't see those guardrails extending all the way back to the data that's being provisioned for the users. Well, I think ultimately, if we got to the point of having better control over our data to saying you should not be using that data element, it's mm -hmm. not you know, the right one for right. representing you know, customer uh, address or something along those lines, um, we're not there yet in the vast majority of companies. I've seen a few that have kind of experimented with data watermarks or something to say, yes, this is the one that you're um, allowed to, uh, to use, has been certified as the, the right one for that purpose, but um, we need to do a lot more in that regard. Yeah, all right, so Tom, you've got a new book that came out earlier this year, uh, Only Humans Need Apply, Winners and Losers in the Age of Smart Machines. Uh, so I'll ask you the same question we ask uh, Eric Brunjolson and Andy McAfee uh, when they wrote The Second Machine Age, you know, are we all out of jobs soon? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they, they and I have become a little more optimistic as we look in some depth at the, at the data. Um, I mean, one 
there are a lot of jobs involving working with these technologies and um, you know, it's just somebody was telling me the other day that um, was a, I was doing a radio interview for my book and the guy I was talking to said, you know, I've made a big transition into podcasting. He said, but the vast majority of people in radio have not been able to make that transition. So if you're willing to kind of go with the flow, learn about new technologies, how they work, I think there are plenty of opportunities. The other thing to, to think about is that these transitions tend to be rather slow. I mean, um, we had about, in the United States in 1980, about half a million bank tellers. Since then, we've had ATMs, online banking, et cetera. Guess how many bank tellers we have in 2016? About half a million. Um, it's rather shocking, I think. I don't know exactly what they're all doing, but um, we're pretty slow in making these transitions, so I think um, those of us sitting here today or even watching are probably okay. We'll see some job loss on the margins, but anybody who's willing to keep up with new technologies and add value to the, the smart machines that come into the workplace, I think is likely to be okay. Okay, uh, do, do you have any advice for people that either are or are looking at becoming you know, chief data officers? Well, yeah, as, I, as you said, balance offense and defense. Defense is a very tricky area to inhabit as a CDO because you, um, if you succeed um, and you prevent you know, breaches and privacy problems and, and security issues and so on, um, nobody gives you necessarily any credit for it or even knows that it's because of your work that you were successful. And um, uh, if you fail, it's obviously very visible and, and bad for your career too. So I think um, you need to supplement uh, um, defense with offense, activities around analytics, adding value to information, digitization, data products, et cetera. And then um, I think it's very important that you make nice with all the other data-oriented C-level executives, you know, um, you may not want to report to a CIO or um, if you have a chief analytics officer or chief information security officer or chief digitization officer or chief digital officer, you've got to present a united front to your organization and figure out what's the division of labor, who's going to do what. Um, uh, in too many of these organizations, some of these people aren't even talking to each other and it's crazy really and very confusing to the, to the rest of the organization about who's doing what. Yeah, do you see the CDO role, you know, five years from now being a standalone, uh, you know, piece uh, in the organization and, you know, any guidance on where that should sit structurally compared to, say, the CIO? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I have said that ideally you'd have a CIO um, or somebody who all of these things reported to who could kind of represent all these different interests of the rest of the organization. That doesn't mean that a CDO shouldn't engage with the rest of the business. I think CIOs should be very engaged with the rest of the business. Um, but I think this uncontrolled proliferation has not been a good thing. It does mean that information and data are really important to organizations, so we need multiple people to address it, but they need to be coordinated somehow. And a smart CEO would say, you guys get your act together and figure out sort of who does what, and tell me a structure. I think multiple different things can work. You can have it inside of IT, outside of IT, but you got to at least be collaborating. Okay, uh, last question I've got is, you, you talked about these eras and you know they, they're not you know, not one dies and the next one comes. And you talked about, you know, we know how slow, you know, people especially are to change. So what happened to the company that are still sitting in the 1.0 or 2.0 era as we see more 3.0 and 4.0 era uh, companies come? Yeah, well, it's not a good place to be in general. And I think what we've seen is this, in many industries, the sophisticated companies with regard to IT are the ones that get more and more market share. The, the um, late adopters end up ultimately going out of business. I mean, you think about um, in retail, who's still around? Walmart was the most aggressive company in terms of technology. Walmart is the world's largest company in uh, um, moving packages around the world. FedEx was initially very aggressive with IT. UPS said, we better get busy, and they did it too. Uh, not too much left of anybody else sending packages around the world, so um, I think in every industry, ultimately, the ones that embrace these ideas tend to be the ones who, who prosper. 
All right. Well, Tom Davenport, really appreciate uh, the, this morning's keynote and sharing with our audience uh, everything that's happening in the space. We'll be back with lots more coverage here from the MIT CDO IQ Symposium. You're watching the Cube. Hi, this is Christopher.